Ninth Meeting, Tuesday, June 18th, 1974. I will begin by explaining Pamma as I have done before. Afterwards, those who have questions that they want to ask will be able to do so. Concerning listening to Thamma, yesterday a question was raised about the ability to remember what is discussed and what its value is if you cannot remember. While listening to a Thamma talk, those who practice understand what is being explained while they are listening. But now the teacher speaks a different language, so you who listen are unable to understand what he is explaining. But if your chitta stays just in front, in other words, the determination to listen at this time has been made, this, together with the flow of tamma that is being explained, goes inward and makes an impression within the chitta. This will make the heart aware of the impact of the sound, and it will at least become calm and cool. This occurs because the sound is an object of attention, aramrna, which can cause the chitta to stay in the present moment. As for those who listen and understand the language all the time while Tamma explanations are being given, they have something which they can know clearly while listening. Then the jitta becomes engrossed in that aspect of Tamma which the teacher is explaining. When explaining Tamma, the teacher must speak about things which are there within us also, which are things to be found everywhere in the world. In other words, the things which the teacher of Tamma talks about, and which Buddhism teaches, concern things that inherently exist within beings everywhere. You should also be able to know those things, and to understand how they are present within yourself. The Lord Buddha also gave instructions about these things, so those who listened to him gradually gained understanding of the truths in the Tamma that he taught. If your jitta is paying close attention to the Tamma that is being taught, your heart will gradually become calm and cool. While listening, you will not think about going to other places or about any objects of attachment. Then your heart can drop into a state of calm, undisturbed and contented, so that you forget the time and your tiredness and stiffness and everything else. If your jitta has a strong inclination to go the way of investigation, which the Lord called vipassana or banya, the story is different. In that case, while tamma is being explained, the jitta will keep moving and following continuously, like walking behind and following in the footsteps of the teacher who is going ahead. Each time he raises a foot, you step in the footprint after him, step by step. In other words, the teacher clears the way so that you may know and understand while listening. When you know, understand, and contemplate following the teacher, you become engrossed and absorbed in examining the kilesas and asavas while you are listening. It is for just this reason that at the time of the Lord Buddha, when the sadhakas listened to the Lord revealing Tamma, many attained Magga, Pala, and Nibbana. Sometimes the jitta advances up to a certain point, and then, when it listens again in the future, the jitta goes higher, and so on, each time going up, step by step, until it reaches the highest point of tamma, which is called penetrating the highest tamma, just by understanding while listening. Not being interested in trying to remember while you are listening to tamma is of value, in that you gain a calm and cool heart, you steadily gain a clear understanding, you gain happiness and contentment, and you gain various skillful methods. These are the good results which can be gained from listening. The same results cannot be gained from trying to remember, such as reciting tamma verses in various suttas over and over again so as to memorize them. Listening to tamma, as done by those who practice, is therefore held in high regard amongst them. I would like to tell you some things about Venerable Adan Man, who was a teacher, Adzariya, in the Gamirtana tradition, so that all of you may know a little about him. What was he most interested in teaching to those followers who went to be trained by him? He was more interested in pointing out the training in Tamma to the bhikkhus and samaneras who went to learn with him than anything else. He would carefully watch the behavior and conduct of the bhikkhus and samaneras under his care, for fear that they might go wrong and deviate from the principles of the Tamma and Vinaya. But first he would emphasize the training and teaching to get the bhikkhus and samaneras to understand the Tamma of the present moment. Matsubanna Tamma, 
which is the focal point of the higher knowing and understanding right up to the highest path and fruition. If there were only bhikkhus and samaneras present when he gave a talk on Tamma, he would go on talking for at least two hours before finishing. Sometimes he talked for three or four hours, and occasionally for six hours. But it was strange how everyone who sat there listening was quiet, not making a sound, almost as if there were no bhikkhus and samaneras there at all. There was only the sound of the tamma that he taught, step by step, without breaking the sequence or missing out any steps until he finished. Regardless of how many bhikkhus and samaneras were present, it was as though none were there, because each was listening with interest and concentrated attention. Each one of them was in a state of calm, the aim of their practice being to attain the truth and tamma so as to have a calm and cool heart. If the jitta steps in towards the realm of wisdom, which means being able to think and contemplate following the Adzariya, the jitta then adjusts and adapts to his tamma all the time. Thus they became absorbed at two distinct levels, firstly at the level of calm. They became absorbed in the way of calm and in the tamma that lulls the jitta into a calm, contented state. Secondly, at the level of wisdom, they became engrossed in the tamma that causes the jitta to steadily gain the way. Their interest in the tamma was such that they did not feel tired or stiff while listening to the teacher give a talk about matters of samadhi and wisdom right through to the end. Matters of sila were not discussed, because they were covered by the practical behavior of each bhikkhu who was present. Ajahn Man talked mostly about the principles of samadhi, wisdom, and vimutti, freedom. On those days when he called a meeting and gave a talk, he was sure to go right through until he reached the subject of the path, fruition, and nibbana in the one talk without ever getting stuck or being diverted. This was due to his character. He had great knowledge and ability in the field of practice, so he exhibited circumspection and great skill in the ways of practice. When our hearts have been continuously trained in the ways of tamma, we will have a basis to hold on to. The person whose heart has a basis to hold on to is, because of that, likely to live happily while being contented in doing his duties and earning a living. He then lives happily and dies happily because he has a basis to hold on to within himself, so he is not likely to be troubled and anxious. Tamma is the basis to hold on to for the heart. Objects in the world are the basis to hold on to, or the dependent conditions, of the body, such as buildings, clothing, and various types of food, which are the supports that the body depends on to live. We must depend on these things because we have been born into this world with bodies that are composed of physical elements. So we must depend on these things as a way of curing ills and maintaining the body continually until the end of our lives. As for the heart, it has tamma as its help as the thing it depends on, as its guardian, and as its nourishment. For it is said that tamma is the food of the heart, or we might say that it is the aramrna of the heart. But in regard to the word aramrna, there are both good and evil aramrna. If the aramrna is not good, it is a poison which inflames the heart, causing it to be troubled and anxious. If the aramrna is good, it makes the heart cool and happy. It then becomes embedded in the heart, which is what they called Upanissaya, or Vasana Bharami, which means the continuous building up of what is good and right. To whatever extent virtue has been developed, it will be embedded in the heart of that person until it becomes a strong Nissaya Vasana. When the heart changes and moves off to another place, another life, Pava, or another realm, Pumi, it must depend on the virtue that one has done and the amount of it that one has accumulated in one's heart. This is what makes the heart go in a good direction and reach sugati, a favorable rebirth. The body has a graveyard with it at all times. Wherever you go to live and set up home, that place becomes a graveyard for the body, regardless of whether you live in the country, in the town, in the forest, the hills, a cave, or on the bare ground, there is always a graveyard waiting there. Because the body has been born, so too is it bound to die. Wherever it dies, that place is a graveyard. This is the way of the body. As for the jitta, 
It has no graveyard, because the heart does not die. Right here is a great and important principle, so please take note of this and remember it well, for this is an unchanging principle of truth in regard to ourselves. If someone has rightly thought about and properly investigated matters of the citta, and tried to practice in himself all the virtues of Dhamma in the teachings, then his hopes and expectations of being reborn in favorable realms of existence will not be disappointed. The intended goal which he sets his heart on will be attained. This is like all of us who have come here to learn today. In other words, we come here to learn Dhamma so that it will go into the heart and be a basis to hold on to, so that the heart will depend on this Dhamma as its ruling principle. Because the heart is something that does not die, it is not destined for the graveyard, unlike the physical elements, which are the body. The body breaks up and disappears, but the heart does not break up. It departs this body and goes into another body. Upon leaving that body, it goes on to another one. The jitta goes higher or lower, up and down, because of those things within the jitta that the Lord called vibhaka, which arise from gamma, i.e., the actions that the jitta itself does. The jitta is the one who thinks and imagines things both good and evil, and the jitta is the one who compels them to go out in the direction of speech or body, causing them to become actions of speech or body. Those actions which are done in the heart are called manogamma, those done by way of speech are called vajigamma, and those done by way of the body are called gayagamma. The word gamma means the doing of action, which can occur in body, speech, or mind. This is important because gamma opens the way for the result of gamma to arise. Sulka and Dukkha, which are the consequences of good and bad gamma, are bound to arise in such a way that they cannot be prevented. Manogamma is action done by way of the mind, which in turn affects speech or bodily actions that may be either good, bad, or neutral in nature. According to the principles of Buddhism, these actions are called gamma. When actions are done, the consequences of those actions, vibhaka, must steadily go on being derived from them in the future. However, the consequences may arise more quickly or more slowly, depending on circumstances. It's like the results of things that we can see in the world. Some arise in a short time, some arise after a while, and some take a long time before they appear. But in the end, they are all just results. These moral consequences are what the Lord Buddha called vipaka, which we all have within our hearts. Although the heart created the causes for these results, we can only remember some of the causes. Many we cannot. But ultimately, we forget them all because we are making gamma all the time, in every realm and in every life, every day and every night, every month and every year. Who can possibly remember all the gamma that he has done since the time he was born in this world? or even that done days or months ago. Even today we cannot remember some of the things that we have thought about, but thinking of and doing good or evil by way of body and speech take place without depending on us being able to remember. They merely depend upon the act of doing them, and the good or bad results coming from those actions are bound to become apparent all the time. This is an important principle. The Lord taught that we should always do good actions, so we should take this opportunity to develop something of value and cure whatever we see to be defective in ourselves. This is not beyond our ability. Once we have gone beyond this life, it is uncertain what the next life will be like. The opportunity to do good actions and partake of their results may not be available in the realms of the ghosts or the devas. To be satisfied with being lazy in doing good in this life, and then expect to go and be energetic in the next life, in the world of ghosts or of devas, this is a wrong way of understanding. All the men of great wisdom have taught us that the person who came to teach us was not stupid. His name was the Lord Buddha. He was the supreme teacher, the teacher of the three realms of existence, the one who truly understood and clearly saw every part and section of the Dhamma which he himself taught with certainty as being the truth. There is no false, changeable Dhamma hidden within his teaching. Thus the Lord called it Svakata Dhamma, which means the Dhamma that the Lord Buddha has taught well. The word well means perfectly and completely in all ways. 
Niyanika Tamma is the Tamma which enables those who practice properly in accord with Tamma to get free from Dukkha progressively. There is no cause for doubt at all, for it is Tamma that is unchanging and certain. Who can speak correctly and precisely every time like the Lord Buddha? Certainly, there has never been anyone else like him in the human world. To make a comparison, if the ordinary person speaks a hundred words, he will speak at least twenty-five that are false and only seventy-five that are true. If he speaks for a long time, his false speech will probably increase until all his words become false. But the words of the Lord Buddha are never false, because his heart is not false. The heart of the Lord is a pure heart. It knows truly and understands truly. That truth is derived from practicing truly. When the Lord taught Tamma, it came from the goodness and truth in his heart, so where could anything false be found? His is a supreme teaching. He is the world teacher in whom all of us can have such implicit faith that we say, the Lord Buddha and the religion of Tamma that he taught are certainly not antagonistic toward any of us. The Lord Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha all possess supreme Tamma excellence that transcends the world. The teaching of the Lord, which is the foundation of Buddhism, was given for the sake of the generations that followed after him. It was not given for the sake of the Lord Buddha, the Tamma, or any of the Zavaka Sangha, all of whom had passed beyond Dukkha already, but it was given just for us. The Lord was not lacking anything that might cause him to desire recompense from us as payment for his teaching. It was solely out of loving kindness and compassion that he gave the teaching to his followers so that they could take it as the direction for them to go. It is our job to practice following the teaching of the Lord, but we see that it is difficult to do, so we feel unable to struggle following the way the Lord went. How then shall we live in this world so as to gain happiness, both bodily and mentally, which is appropriate to human beings who are clever in searching for happiness for themselves? This is a question that we should consider and ask ourselves at those times when laziness and carelessness arise, so as to cure those faults, which are like Mara, the evil one, waiting to block our way forward. We can cure them by practicing Tamma, using our skill and cleverness in order to find a way to gain happiness and the fulfillment of our hopes. In that way, we will not be entirely obstructed in every existence and every life, all the time, every day, like we are now. Today, people's hearts are so full of dukkha that they cannot find any way of gaining happiness. This is to be expected when there are so many people in the present world that there is almost no space on the earth left for them to live. Still, there are people who are clever and sharp-witted enough to find a means of struggling through the difficulties to find peace of mind. How should we examine and contemplate? When we simply wait for quick and easy results, we cannot accomplish anything. The Buddha's teaching is true and correct in every respect, but when we try to practice it accordingly, we see it as being difficult. We are looking for comfort, but where does comfort actually come from? We have been living in this world a long time, but have we ever found true comfort? We should question ourselves in this way. Maybe it will start us thinking. If comfort merely depended on our desires, wanting comfort, wanting ease and relaxation, we ought to be people with ease and relaxation since long ago, so we should not be shouldering a mass of dukkha like people everywhere in the world. But this does not accord with the image formed in our minds, which symbolizes what the heart wants, an image of ease and comfort created by the Gilesas. The Gilesas have been deceiving people in this way for a very long time, but people still do not see the harmfulness of their deception at all. On the contrary, they agree wholeheartedly with the Gilesas' soothing suggestions and allow themselves to be lulled to sleep. The main teachers in the Round of Sangsara are the Gilesas themselves. Once they have taught people, people become addicted to them. So more and more people come until the Gilesas cannot handle them all. People very much like their tricky methods of teaching, never feeling bored or satiated by the Gilesas, even though they have always led the Dukkha and torment. The supreme teacher of freedom from the round of Sangsara is the Lord Buddha, the first venerable one, the first to know and the first to train and teach. There is nobody who is his equal. But the Gelesas do not accept this, so they continually obstruct Tamma. Those beings who like the Gelesas will generally be bored with Tamma, 
so the Dhamma is therefore unlikely to reach their hearts even if they listen and practice for a long time. If you have any doubts about this, please look at yourselves and you will be able to see this well enough without difficulty. So we must analyze ourselves. If we are pupils who follow the teacher, our supreme teacher, the Buddha, then we must try to do good so as to wash away all things which are evil and bad. Fighting them is bound to be hard and difficult to some extent, but that is only normal. We must constantly think like this, which is better than having the gelezas of laziness and slothfulness come to be our teacher and then drag us into ways that are base and low, causing us to suffer dukkha and torment without end. Only then will we be able to get free from dukkha. Now is our opportunity, so we should be organized and ready, for we are now complete in everything. Our bodies are in good health, and we know that we are human beings who have found Buddhism. This is an opportunity for us to develop virtue so that it goes down into the heart, enabling us to reach the goal that we want. Only the heart and Dhamma will be able to fulfill our hopes. We must try to add things that are good and right to the balance sheet of the heart. Apart from that, we cannot find anything that is certain, because the whole world of mundane conventions is impermanent, anitta. That includes our own bodies, which, like everything else we rely upon, will be destroyed and disappear time after time. We see this all the time. It happens everywhere. The Lord said that everything which surrounds us both externally and internally is anitta, dukkha, and anatta. So we cannot trust anything except the development of virtue, which means training ourselves to gain a steady accumulation of virtue in the way of tamma. This is an important principle to follow if we want to bring our purpose steadily to completion. A heart with virtue always aims to go beyond this world. It wants to live happily. It does not want to remain in a mass of dukkha and torment. If we talk about levels of existence, in other words, the heavens and the Brahma worlds, it is the heart that wants to go there. It does not want to go down to the hells at all. In fact, Dukkha is something that the heart does not want to experience or come into contact with at all. So, why does the world find it and experience it all the time? Because the Gelesas and their deluding tricks, which are in command, are smarter and cleverer than all living beings. They are the teachers that teach beings, dragging them all down and submerging them in Dukkha, even though they do not want to be submerged. Who are the primary teachers of the round of samsara, the Vata, the ones that are the cleverest in the world nowadays? Just the Gilesas, Tanha, and Asava. Apart from these, there are none more clever in the three realms of relativity, Zammudi, where all beings dwell, and there is nothing that can extract and get rid of these Gilesas apart from the Svakata Tamma of the Lord Buddha. Whoever strives diligently to transcend Dukkha by practicing according to the Tamma of the Lord will have a way to pass beyond it. Those who are diligent in complaining about Dukkha can complain as they please. But if we do not want to let the Gelesas ridicule and mock us again and again, we should constantly try to understand ourselves. When we arrive at a time when we are cornered with no way out and we are truly up against it, a time that is critical for us, what will we do? We must consider that prospect and question ourselves well beforehand. When it is cold, we see those things that make us warm as being important. When it is hot, what are those things that will make us cool? Whatever they are, we will consider them to be important at that time. When Dukkha comes to us, what are those things which bring us Sulkha? The other half of the pair that is linked to Sulkha is virtue, and this is the means by which Dukkha can be diminished and eventually eliminated. Virtue can eliminate Dukkha in a positive manner without any shadow of doubt, because never, since time immemorial, have any of the Gilesas been able to overpower the Thamma. Now, suppose a man falls into deep water, and there is nothing to grasp or hold on to to keep him from drowning. Even though he has been afraid of ghosts since he was born, if a dead body were to float by him while he was drowning and desperate for something to hold on to, he would immediately grab hold of that corpse as it floated by in order to save his life. 
At the same time, he would forget his long-standing fear of ghosts because his life would be much more important than his fear. This simile illustrates the mentality of someone who reaches a critical juncture in his life where he feels cornered with no way out. The last moment at the end of your life is sure to be like this. At that critical juncture, the jitta is bound to recall the virtue or the evil that you have done in that life. When we have no virtue adhering to us that is sufficient to give us some warmth of heart, then we are bound to recall the evil that we have done as the only alternative. Then anxiety and sorrow arise and pile up within the jitta, causing the anxiety associated with dying to increase further and further until it becomes overwhelming. If we have done virtuous deeds, as soon as we think about that virtue, the jitta immediately grasps onto it and goes quite calm. This is experienced much more so by those who have practiced virtue constantly. They need not be in doubt. That virtue is a companion and a friend that we can trust our lives to more truly than anything in the world. We Buddhists should always understand about ourselves, which means that the heart is the one thing that matters. It can be understood from two points of view. Firstly, who is the teacher of the round of samsara? And secondly, who is the teacher of freedom from the round of samsara? Both of these I have just explained. Please do not forget it. Questions and Answers First question, Woman 1. When I practice samadhi, I am liable to go into yogi sleep, going deep into pavanga. Some people say this is good, and some say that it's not. Who is right in this? Answer. Please explain yogi sleep and tell me what you feel about it. After you have come out of it, what remains in your jitta? Woman 1. Nothing remains of it, but I feel more fresh and lively. Answer. One person says it is good. Another says it is not good. But why do you go on believing them? You must know for yourself whether it is good or not. Therefore, it would not be right for me to say anything about this for fear that you may get attached to my words. The tamma presented here is at the beginning stage, so it has still not divided up and branched out enough so that the learner can gain value from it. So it is best to answer some questions and not to answer others. Answering everything fully can be poison to the jitta. The person himself should examine the results that come from his own jitta. My explanations must depend on who it is that asks the question. The answers I give, whether ordinary, middling, or high, will be appropriate to the level of attainment of that person. The nature of this question makes me think that the questioner's basis of tamma is uncertain. Those who practice meditation must have gone through this stage. If they have practiced samadhi until the jitta drops down deep, they must know. If they go to sleep in meditation and wake up knowing nothing, then there is only sleepiness all the time. So how can they know anything about the jitta? Samadhi does not mean sleeping and knowing nothing. You must know specifically within yourself and not know anything else apart from yourself. On the other hand, if, as soon as the jitta is about to drop down into samadhi, we do not let it drop down but force it to work, we will never be able to build up a firmness of the jitta which accords with the teaching of samadhi for the attainment of calm. So we have to find the proper balance between calm and alertness. Second question. Woman 2. I still do not understand about the heart and anatta. Answer. Do you understand atta? The questioner replied, Yes, I understand. Have you ever practiced samadhi? Yes. For the jitta that has gained calm with any given object of attention, aramana, whatever method was used to do this may also be used to learn about atta or anatta accordingly. To begin with, however, you should hold on to atta. Later on, you will gradually withdraw your attachment to atta until you can completely get rid of it, because the jitta is naturally complete in and of itself. But the detached jitta is not self or atta, which is a mundane convention, sammudi, for it is free, vimutti, and therefore different. 
Third question, man one. How should we act so as to do samadhi properly? In normal daily life we have work which we must do. Must we stop doing it so that we can practice constantly? Answer. If the jitta knows about its own development and its own deterioration, it can progress steadily as the opportunity presents itself. But if it does not understand these things, then the jitta becomes confused. Meditation depends upon the jitta and the opportunity. If you have a lot of work to do and meditation deteriorates, then you fail to gain the results which you should gain. In that case, we say that the jitta deteriorates. But in truth, the jitta does not deteriorate, for it is only the characteristic that indicates development or deterioration in the jitta. For it is only the characteristics that indicate development or deterioration in the jitta that are affected. The jitta itself does not deteriorate. Fourth question, man two. What about monkey practice? Which means seeing someone else doing something and then acting as if one is doing the same. What should one do to know whether our practice is true or not true? Answer. You yourself will know that for yourself. The answer is already inherent in your question. We ourselves are the central theme, so there is no need to seize hold of an artificial shadow. Fifth question, man three. You said that when the jitta constantly accumulates much virtue, it then goes to be born in a better place. I would like to know what is meant by better. Answer. The jitta makes gamma, and the result of that gamma remains with the jitta. It then sends the jitta off so that it brings about what is appropriate to that result itself. The owner of that jitta does not know about this and does not have any way to find out. But the Lord Buddha and the Savakas were able to know. Therefore there is a general delusion throughout the world regarding the nature of the jitta and what it contains. If we do the practice correctly, the jitta will know itself. When the jitta is skilled, mindfulness and wisdom are bound to become more and more subtle. Then you will be able to know for yourself without having to ask anyone else. Nothing transcends the power of mindfulness and wisdom. And because all the gilesas are afraid of mindfulness and wisdom, no gilesas of any sort can exceed the power of mindfulness and wisdom that have been trained to proficiency. Sixth question, man four. Is it difficult for the jitta to return and become a human being or not? Answer. You have been born as a human being. Was that difficult? We do not know about ourselves because the jitta has no strength. If we have mindfulness, then we will steadily come to know. I have previously explained that the kanthas have the nature to break up. At the moment when the kanthas are about to break up, the jitta turns about and becomes powerful. The amount of suffering we experience at the moment when the jitta is about to part from the kanthas will be an indication of whether the jitta has mindfulness or not. Those who practice usually understand the ephemeral nature of the jitta, for nothing is more subtle than the jitta, and it cannot be measured. If the jitta has mindfulness and wisdom, then we can follow it. This must depend on the mindfulness and wisdom which people have developed, and whether it is much or little accordingly. It is said that at the time when the Lord Buddha was about to enter Parinibbana, he entered Chana Samapati, and went up from the first Chana until he reached Sanya Vedayeta Nirodha. The venerable Anuruddha Thera, who was very skilled in the ways of the jitta, set his jitta to follow the Lord Buddha in whichever chana the jitta of the Lord Buddha entered. The Lord went up through the four rupa chanas and then through the four arupa chanas until he reached Sanyave Dayeta Nirodha. He rested there for a moment and then he withdrew back through the arupa chanas and the rupa chanas until he reached the state of jitta of ordinary purity. Then he entered the first chana and went through to the fourth chana. After that, the Lord entered Parinibbana between the Rupatanas and the Arupatanas. From then on, it was beyond the ability of anybody to follow and know, because he had gone beyond and was free from every kind of mundane convention. While the Lord was entering the various chanas, the venerable Anuruddha Thera sent the flow of his jitta to follow the Lord without letting up. He knew by following the state of the Lord Buddha's jitta from stage to stage. When the other Savakas asked him, Has the Lord entered Parinibbana yet? 
He answered, Not yet. He told them each time the Lord entered and left each successive Tana, so he was able to tell them what happened step by step until the moment when the Lord entered Parinibbana. Why was he able to know, from moment to moment, the progress of the Lord with Tazjitta while he was entering and leaving each Tana? This is very different from us who also have minds that receive and know various things up to a certain level. The knowledge and ability of the Jitta that has been fully trained is as different from the ordinary Jitta as the sky is from the earth. The Jitta which is filled with a heavy burden, as if a cesspit were weighing it down all the time, can in no way be compared with the Jitta that has become fully purified. Clever people are therefore likely to believe in those who have knowledge and ability above their own capacity and to accept them as teachers. Like the followers of the Buddha who believe the Lord to be a world teacher and thus they are refuge. This differs from stupid people who deludedly think that they are clever until their cleverness leads them to breakdowns, destruction, and ruin. Even then, it is unlikely they will realize their own stupidity. There is a lot of this kind of cleverness in the world of human beings and it seems to be increasing at an unimaginable rate until one fears that there will be no world for us to live in.